Hello everyone, Economic Ninja here. We're gonna to talk today about what is macroeconomics. You know, a lot of people throw that word around, but I don't think a lot of people go in depth explaining it. And it's really important that you know what it is and how to apply it to your life and your investing philosophy because it will make you a much better investor, all right? So first, macroeconomics is a branch of economics that studies the behavior of an overall economy which encompasses markets, businesses, consumers, and governments. Macroeconomics explains economy-wide phenomena uh, such as inflation, price levels, rate of economic growth, national income, gross domestic product, and changes in unemployment. Some of the key questions addressed by macroeconomics includes what causes unemployment? What causes inflation? What creates or stimulates economic growth? Macroeconomics attempts to measure how well an economy is performing, understand what forces drive it, and project how performance can improve. Real quick before I go on, I gotta thank Investopedia for all this information because you know what? Being the ninja is a little tough and they put it together really nicely. So thank you so much. Now, let's talk about understanding uh, this, this macroeconomics. As the term implies, macroeconomics is a field of study that analyzes an economy through a wide lens. This includes looking at variables like unemployment, GDP, and inflation. In addition, macroeconomic economists, I can't believe they have these words, macroeconomists, you know, economics people that went to school and, you know, talk about macro. Develop models explaining the relationship between these factors. These models and the forecast they produce are used by government entities to aid in constructing and evaluating economic, monetary, and fiscal policy. Businesses use the models to set strategies in domestic and global markets, and investors use them to predict the plan for movements in various asset classes. Properly applied, economic theories can illuminate how economies function and the long-term consequences of particular policies and decisions. Macroeconomic theory can also help individual businesses and investors make better decisions through a more thorough understanding of the effects of broad economic trends and policies on their own industries. So let's talk a little bit of the history of all of this. While the term macroeconomics dates back to the 1940s, many of the field's core concepts have been subject of study for much longer. Topics like unemployment, prices, growth, and trade have concerned economists since the beginning of the discipline in the 1700s. Elements of earlier work from Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill addressed issues that would now be recognized as the domain of macroeconomics. In its modern form, macroeconomics is often defined as starting with John Maynard Keynes and his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. This was dating back all the way to 1936. In it, Keynes explained the fallout from the Great Depression when goods went unsold and workers were unemployed. Before the popular popularization of Keynes' theories, economists generally did not differentiate between macro uh, economics and microeconomics. The same microeconomic law of supply and demand that operate in individual goods markets were understood to interact between individual markets to bring the economy into general equilibrium as described by Leon Walras. The link between goods markets and large scale financial variables such as price levels and interest rates was explained through the unique role that money plays in the economy as a medium of exchange by economists such as Nut Wixell. How would you like that name? Nut Wixell, Knut? It's spelled K-N-U-T. I'm sure you guys can figure it out, but for this recording, it's Nut Wixell. Irving Fisher and Ludwig von Mises. Macroeconomics versus microeconomics. It's really important that you know the two. I have done a video on macroeconomics. If you want to check it out, I'll put a link somewhere. I don't know if I'll put it up there or there, down there, maybe down there. I don't know. Macroeconomics differs from microeconomics, which focuses on smaller factors that affect choices made by individuals. Individuals are typically classified into subgroups, such as buyers, sellers, and business owners. These actors interact with each other according to the laws of supply and demand for resources, using money and interest rates as pricing mechanisms for coordination. Factors studied 
uh, studied in both microeconomics and macroeconomics typically influence one another. Now, a key dis, uh, distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics is that macroeconomics aggregates, uh, uh, aggregates, sorry, can sometimes behave in very different ways or even the opposite of similar microeconomic variables. For example, Keynes uh, referenced the so-called paradox of thrift, which argues that individuals save money to build wealth on a microeconomic level. However, when everyone tries to increase their savings at once, it can contribute to a slowdown in the economy and less wealth in the aggregate micro or sorry, macroeconomic level. I'll give you an example of that. If everyone all of a sudden stopped spending money and started saving money, well, since that money is not moving into the broad economy, like people going out to eat, going and buying vehicles or going to the movies, then all of those companies are going to suffer. People are going to be laid off the waitresses or waiters at the restaurant, the people working at the theaters, the car salesman is going to uh, be laid off because nobody's spending their money. So you can see where if all of a sudden people do it all at once, that's why there's a big difference with a certain subgroup of people, subgroup of people that start saving. When you start to watch that number grow, it moves from microeconomics to macroeconomics. Now let's talk about some of the limitations of this. It's also important to understand that the limitations of economic theory um, theories are often created in a vacuum and lack of specific real world details like taxation, regulation, and transaction costs. The real world is also decidedly complicated and it includes matters of social preference and uh, conscience that do not lend themselves to mathematical analysis. Even with the limits of economic theory, it's important and worthwhile to follow significant macroeconomic indicators like GDP, inflation, and unemployment. This is because the performance of companies and the extension of their stocks is significantly influenced by the economic conditions in which the companies operate. Likewise, it is invaluable to understand which theories are currently in favor and how they may be influencing a particular government administration. Such economic theories can say much about how a government will approach taxation, regulation, government spending, and similar policies. By better understanding economics and the ramifications of economic decisions, investors can get at least a glimpse of a uh, probable future and act accordingly with confidence. So let's talk about a couple different schools of thought when we talk about this type of economic structure. The field of macroeconomics is organized into many different schools of thought with differing views on how the markets and their participants operate, okay? So classical would be the first one. Classical economists held that uh, prices, wages, and rates are flexible and the market tends to clear unless prevented from doing so by government policy. These ideas built on Adam Smith's original theories, the term classical economists is not actually a school of macroeconomic thought, but a label applied first by Karl Marx and later by Keynes to denote previous economic thinkers with whom they disagreed. Next would be Keynesian. Keynesian economists uh, were founded uh, mainly based off the words works of John Maynard Keynes and was the beginning of macroeconomics as a separate area of study from microeconomics. Keynesians focus on aggregate demand and the principal factor in issues like unemployment and the business cycle. These are two parts of Keynesian economics that I really have bought into and understand to be true. Keynesian uh, economists believe that the business cycle can be managed by active government intervention intervention through fiscal policy where governments spend more in recessions to stimulate demand or uh, spend less in expansions to decrease it. Now, with that being said, just a little side note, governments always manipulate uh, these economies and what happens is they always overshoot. So you have to be ready for that. Even though government intervention can really, ha it really does have real life effects on economies, they always overshoot and things always go uh, way bigger or way less than they wanted. So you have to be ready for that, right? But they also believe in monetary policy where the central bank stimulates uh, lending with lower rates or restricts it with higher ones. Keynesian economists also believe that certain um, uh, parts of the system, particularly sticky prices, prevent proper clearing of supply and demand. 
You know, it's really important to realize that we are in this sort of Keynesian world right now where our central bank is constantly manipulating information, right? Uh, it's manipulating interest rates. It's manipulating the amount of money that they lend out and then uh, how much, uh, you know, they're either giving to uh, for loans or that they're pulling back. Now, next, I want to talk about New Classical. New Classical School is along with the New Keynesians. It's mainly built on integrating microeconomics foundations into macroeconomics to resolve the glaring theoretical contradictions between the two subjects. New Classical School emphasizes the importance of microeconomics and models based on that behavior. New Classical econo uh, economists assume that all agents try to maximize their utility and have rational expectations, which they incorporate into macroeconomic models. New classical economists believe that unemployment is largely voluntar uh, voluntary and that discretionary fiscal policy destabilizes while inflation can be controlled with monetary policy. But again, we have to go back to governments and central banks always overshoot the mark. Next is New Keynesian. The New Keynesian School also attempts to add micro uh, economic foundations to traditional Keynesian economic theories. While New Keynesians accept that households and firms operate based on rational expectations, they still maintain that there are a variety of market failures, including sticky prices and wages. When you think sticky prices, think about what Jerome Powell says when he thought that inflation was transitory. It was just gonna move through certain parts of the economy and then it would go away. Jay Powell reiterating that inflation has increased notably in recent months, but does remain transitory in his written testimony for his hearing tomorrow. So start thinking that way, right? The government can improve macroeconomic conditions through fiscal and monetary policy. That's what they believe. Next, something that pretty much everybody's heard about is Austrian economics. The Austrian school is an older school of economics that is seeing some resurgence in popularity. Austrian economic theories mainly apply to microeconomic phenomena. However, the so-called classical economists, they never strictly separated microeconomics and macroeconomics. Austrian theories have uh, also, or also have important implications for what are otherwise considered macroeconomic subjects. In particular, the Austrian business cycle theory explains broadly synchronized swings in economic activity across markets due to monetary policy and the role that money and banking play in linking markets to each other across time. So let's talk about some of these indicators. Macroeconomics is rather broad, a broad field, but two specific research areas dominate the discipline. The first area looks at the factors that determine long-term economic growth. The other looks at the causes and consequences of short-term fluctuations in national income and, un and employment, uh, also known as the business cycle, all right? Now, when we're talking about economic growth, Economic growth refers to an increase in aggregate production in an economy. Macroeconomic, macro economists try to understand the factor that either promote or retard economic growth to support economic policies that will support development, progress, and rising living standards. Economists can use many indicators to measure economic performance. So these 10 indicators, we're gonna go over them real quickly. Gross domestic product indicators. This measures how much the economy produces. S consumer spending indicators. This measures how much capital consumers feed back into the economy. Next, we have income and savings indicators, measuring how much consumers make and save. Then we also have industry performance indicators. This measures GDP by specific industries. Next is international trade and investment indicators. These indicate the balance of payments between trade partners, how much is traded and how much is invested inter internationally. Let's use, for example, the, uh, the Japanese yen versus the US dollar trade pack. How much of the US goods are going to Japan as opposed to how much of Japan goods are coming here to America. Next, we have price and inflation indicators. These indicate fluctuations in prices paid for goods and services and changes in currency purchasing power. And I guarantee you, just about everybody watching this video is now really understanding price inflation. Next, we have investment and fixed asset indicators. These indicate how much capital is tied up in fixed assets. Then 
un or sorry, employment indicators show employment by industry, state, country, and other areas. Then we have two more left. We've got government indicators, which show how much the government spends and receives, and we're seeing that in a massive, massive way right now. And then last but not least are special indicators. These include all other economic indicators, such as distribution of personal income, global value chains, healthcare spending, small business, well-being, and more. So think about that as a big catch-all, all right? Now, superimposed over long-term macroeconomic growth trends, the levels and rates of change of significant macroeconomic variables such as employment and national output go through fluctuations. These fluctuations are called expansions, peaks, recessions, and troughs. They also occur in that order when chartered uh, on a, on a graph, these fluctuations show that businesses perform in cycles. Thus, it's called the business cycle. The National Bureau of Economic Research measures the business cycle, which, is, which uses GDP and gross national income uh, to date the cycle. The NBER is also the agency that declares the beginning and the end of recessions and expansions. You've probably never even heard about this, but there's actually an agency that officially declares it. And you've seen it lately with our president deciding to go, I'm just going to change the, uh, the definition of recession. So what is the most important concept in all of macroeconomics? The most important concept is said to be the output, which refers to the total amount of goods and services that a country produces. Output is often considered a snapshot of an economy at a given moment. So now, what's the bottom line? Macroeconomics is a field of study used to evaluate overall economic performance and develop actions that can positively affect an economy. Economists work to understand how specific factors and actions affect output, input, spending, consumption, inflation, and employment. The study of economics began a long time ago, but the field didn't start evolving into its current form until the 1700s. Macroeconomics now plays a large part in government and business decision-making, and it should make a big part in yours as well as an investor. I hope you got something out of this. It's a tough subject to conquer, but I thought it'd be good for the channel to really go over it and give you a broad overview or actually dive in a little bit too to what this is and how this can help you in your decision-making process. All right, with that being said, thank you so much. The Economic Ninja is out.